context, everybody has to agree which hash function it is. So all you need to have this big, huge representation available. So the basic idea in all this stuff is that we define H via uh, a comparatively small random C. And what do we mean by that? That's again, this is just to reestablish terminology based, losing some of the thing, uh, things that have been said before, so the classic example.
that are so painful to hash, we don't want to do a degree six polynomial over some really some things from a really large domain because each multiplication requires many multiplications by the computer. So what we want to do instead is we want to Yeah, we took it 
standard, in a standard programming language like C, so I'm just talking about simple portable code, uh, is mod 2 to the double. Okay, so uh, it's often called this task. Okay, so that's the whole point in this uh, thing that happens in C. And now you can see where some of the issue is. Well, And then what we do is we throw away some bits. These are shifted out. Okay. So then we are left with the bits that start from here and go to W minus L. Okay. That's all what the code does if you think more like a computer. If you want to think of it as a mathematician, you would say something that looks curved, looks complicated. And we would say A times X mod 2 to W. C 
times 2 to the i, uh, where c is r. OK, so basically i is just equal to the least significant bit of y minus x. OK? So, and then also it's convenient to say that a is equal to 1 plus something this is embarrassing I forgot to say that A is an odd W bit number it's odd so it's uniform how to write that odd uniform uh, W bit ok so contrasting these other schemes where we had where we just had completely uniform A and B here A
something which, again, when we look at this picture here, we get something which has zero, 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 and then down to this position where we keep the one here, and then after that we get the uniform. I will not get into any of the details of it, but 
numbers with two dot duplicate numbers. There's still quite a bit of saving on before, where we said we actually needed to have almost four W bits, at least in the answer of the multiplication. And so still, this is still a very good one to know. Then we just talk a little bit about what, why we should care a lot about strong universality. Um, That's the same thing. So the point is, suppose we have strong universal uh, it goes from nu into some domain R. Right. And then we want to sample.
this is, as I say, this is exactly where we use it. It's too independent. Otherwise, it would simply not be true. Okay, so this thing here is just equal to that again, n element, so it's equal to n times p times one minus p. And all I care about is that this thing is less than n times p. Okay. So what does this then mean? That means that if I check the chips, inequality, that means that the probability that xA is deviates from its expectation and p by uh, more than t times the standard deviation. less than 1 over t squared. Okay. So, so this is the important thing here is that we are looking at the case where we sample elements. Here we just sample these elements and we see how many we get and we have an expectation which is np. It's kind of hard to read but it's np and the amount we expect to deviate by that is only the square root. So this basically means that we can use these uh, two independent sampling to get some reasonable statistics, because at least we have the right kind of variance. Okay. If you had four independent hash functions, then you could talk about uh, uh, using both moment bounds, a little bit like what uh, Rasmus did before. But this thing about having statistics is just one of the most crucial uh, uh, usages of sampling. And the exercise you get after this one I'm done Talking will uh, take you through a lot of uh, sampling here, doing some things, similarity estimation, stuff like that, that you do in connection with machine learning and things like that. Okay. So that's that. But uh, again, how do we get from, uh, so what we saw here was, well, you didn't quite see it, was that we actually do have very efficient scheme for two independent sampling. Again, they're not as independent as efficient as universal schemes, but we actually have two efficient ways of dealing with that when we're dealing with W-bit numbers and if you have a machine that can actually uh, do multiplication of two W-bit numbers. Okay, because again, A and B have to be two W-bit numbers. Here comes also an important application of two independent. So the point is, if we're having vectors, and uh, vector hat. Okay. So we have some vector x, which is equal to uh, x normal. Then to compute h of x, all we have to do is to say that's equal to h no of x no x all x all and up to h e minus one of x e minus one, and that's it. Find 
this way, it is actually also too independent. Okay. And it's not so hard to see because if you had an odd P which have a difference somewhere, then you can just say that wherever they're different, that gives you two different hash values that are going to affect the overall answer so that they become a different the nice thing is this thing here would not work if we just do, this kind of composition would not have worked if these things were just universal. Because it just says that you have no collisions. And it's sort of an easy exercise to see that if we, for example, use the universal hash function that presented first, and we look at keys that only differ in the most significant bits, what's going to happen is that the hash values also only differ in the most significant bits. And that will mean when we start composing things and we just use two of them, then they are just going to be all the same. The hash values, the hash ones are going to collide all the time when we apply it to a vector, even though we avoided collisions when we just look at one guy. Okay. But this is very useful because now we have actually found, if we can solve these things, we have found an efficient way of hashing up to the different uh, values. In fact, it, it's kind of clear if you were a little bit better, so what you would really do if you had a scheme like this one here, here comes a cool trick in a second, which is just here that we have x1, <coughs> x0 to x p e minus 1, and they are double bit numbers. And then we So the question is, what do we do if we 
have to deal with variable length squares. And so you can say, what I'm really trying to do here, you probably have said more of that, is that, again, hashing is used so much, and, and I've worked in these 14 years for at and and it's just the one thing that's used everywhere, and it's sort of in the loop of most computation, and since it's a very large practical computational resource that are used inside hashing. And most people don't know how to make efficient hashing. There's this huge discrepancy between the textbooks that talks about A plus X mod B, and you run that, and it often ends up being bottleneck in the system. And then we actually have hashing schemes like the ones that I'm talking about there that are extremely efficient, often they're not the bottleneck in the sense that often at the end of the day you have to put a lookup somewhere, and that lookup is much, much slower than these hash, hash computations. And that's why I think it's important to tell you guys how you can actually make efficient hashing. Okay. So the last thing is just what do we then do with variable and strings, and that's sort of the last thing I'm going to talk about here. And it's again a very cute trick, which is basically the sort simple um, thing. So you do a simple trick. Now we don't know in advance how long it will be, or we don't want to have. At the moment, the space we don't we store is proportional. The number of random words we store is proportional to the length of the string. So we want something where we don't want to store a lot, no matter how long the string is. Okay. So what you do is you pick a prime.
send a random variable into polynomial and ask if it gets to zero. Okay. I think I will. Uh, so this is what you should know about variable and string hashing. And the last thing I want to say. Is that what you do in practice is that we had this scheme over there which was very so we had we had fast hash of say d less than equal to some other bound d works. That's just this scheme. Where we are willing to store a coefficient for every single word that we want to hash. So we have that's very efficient. So this thing here is kind of slow. I complained about before that we want to do things about P, you involve the same primes, all this kind of stuff. It's going to be rather slow. So what you do is that we have a fast hash function that's just called H that works for this up to this many words. What you do is that when you have a long string,
then you can just see, have I seen it somewhere else? And you can do that very quickly. Okay. So the point is, if you want to be ready to hash books, having a whole book full of uh, W bit numbers, well, I guess it's not that bad for a computer, but at least in principle, it's kind of annoying to need to have so many things lying around. So then you need something which allows you to handle variable length strings, and then you can use a scheme like this one, which is a really cool idea. It's unfortunately pretty slow in the sense that the price you pay to hash each word is you end up doing this multiplication modular prime, which is just a pretty hefty price to pay. So you don't want to do that everywhere. So all you just do is to say, well, we can, we can divide the things into blocks, and you just hash each block. Okay, so because the point is, if I have two different strings and they're different somewhere, there will be at least one block in which they differ, and as long as you don't get any collisions in that in those blocks, then the strings of signatures will still remain different. And then I just need to hash these strings of signatures and I'm all done. Okay. And these are, I know it's a lot of sort of, you can call them silly small tricks or whatever, like this thing here from crypto, which I think is really cool, but it did save a fact type two and stuff like that. And also because, yeah, these things are open bottlenecks. Like at ATT, we had to do a lot of hashing of internet traffic, and the point is when traffic zooms to a router, you can't ask the traffic to stop because you want to take notes. Either you're fast enough or you're not, and then the whole thing is just lost. Okay, so um, this concludes what I want to talk about with the strong universality and the universality thing, and I have an exercise for you.